transcending history and the world, a tale of souls and swords, eternally retold. The legend will never die. The Sega Master System has always been something of an underrated console. It's a great little system with a strong library of hidden gems that was forced to live in the shadow of the NES. An issue that was further compounded by the fact that Japan, the US and Canada only received a fraction of the console's full library. But no matter which region you live in, ask any Master System owner what are the best games for the console and sooner or later, Zillion will pop up. Released worldwide in 1987, Zillion is a video game adaptation of an anime called Red Photon Zillion, or Just Zillion in the West, which in of itself was a collaboration between Sega and Tatsunoko and a tie-in to promote a toy lizard tag gun. <laughs> Ironically, the Zillion toy that actually spawned this franchise has now become the most obscure thing to carry the Zillion name. The tie-in to Sega was so strong that the Zillion Laser Tech toy looks almost exactly like the Sega Master System Light Phaser. And, weirdly enough, suspiciously similar to the ZX Spectrum Light Gun. Anyway, Zillion for the Master System is kind of hard to describe. Some people call it a Metroidvania, while others call it an evolution on the Impossible Mission formula. And it's honestly a little of both. I mean, the Impossible Mission inspiration can be seen clear as day. But then you also have weapons, persistent upgrades, as well as new zones and areas that you will unlock as you gain new powers and even a leveling up system. But I'm probably getting ahead of myself. In Zillion, you play as JJ, an operative from the White Knight Special Forces, who have to defend their planet against the Noza, an alien race who invaded their planet. Yeah, I know the game and manual technically say they're called the Norsa, but in the anime they're called the Noza, and as far as I know, the game is based off the show, and not the other way around. And besides, the name Noza is very similar to a certain group whose name I cannot pronounce due to the YouTube algorithm, so it's very possible that the name Norsa is actually the result of English censorship. Anyway, the White Knights are armed with the powerful Zillion guns, and you, along with your teammates Champ and Apple, were sent on a mission to recover 5 floppy disks and destroy the enemy base, except the rest of your team got captured, so now you have to rescue them as well. The game takes place in just one giant level similar to Impossible Mission or Metroid. And while the Noza base is pretty large, I'd say that it's nowhere near the size of Planet Zebes from the first Metroid, nor is it anywhere near as labyrinthian or confusing as the first Metroid game. In fact, for the most part, you can easily tell what you need to do or where you need to go, as all the rooms and the game map itself are all square-shaped. Anyway, as JJ, you can jump, run, duck and shoot and you need to enter every room in the Noza dungeon, blow up containers and get a code symbol. Then you insert a keycard into a computer in that room and then put those same symbols in any order. Doing this will unlock doors or elevators which will then take you to the next room. This may sound simple, but as the game progresses, the rooms not only get progressively more difficult, but you also start running into branching paths. Now, one of my main issues with Zillion were these symbols, as I often found them too complicated to memorize, and I just didn't like having to pause the game to write the code for every single room. 
I mean, you can't even check online guides because the codes will always be randomized with each new game. But luckily, after watching Hungry Garaya's review on Zillion, great channel by the way, you should subscribe to her, I realized that a lot of these symbols are just mirrored numbers. So this is actually two nines mirrored, two sevens, two sixes, and the ones that aren't mirrored numbers are easy enough to memorize like heart, money symbol, zero, double O, and basically, yeah, you need to instantly attribute a word or number to each of these symbols. Once you do that, memorizing a code becomes a cakewalk, as you only ever need to use it once for that room, which will then stay unlocked forever. So once I did that, I started making my way through the rooms and clearing them like a champ. But there's more to the game than just this. For one thing, rooms will often be filled with enemies, alarm sensors, laser barriers, mines and automated turrets. For the most part, you can clear these just fine through platforming, but some rooms can get overwhelming or are designed so that you cannot just jump over or crawl underneath these hazards. When that happens, you can access the computer and input any of the 10 codes you're given at the start, which will disable just about any danger you come across except for the mines and enemies. The issue is that using these codes will consume a keycard, which are also used to open doors. And while it's easy to acquire a good stock of keycards, if you ever run out in the middle of the base, you might have just screwed yourself without realizing it. Thankfully, you can acquire keycards by searching containers or leaving the enemy base and paying Amy a visit who will replenish your health and give you a keycard if you don't have any in your inventory. Still, while these codes are super useful, they do come with a few caveats. Yes, you can disable traps, turrets and sensors, but only temporarily, so you'll have to be quick and get all the code symbols you need before they come back on. Alternatively, you can also use teleport codes to warp back to the entrance and heal yourself with Amy. But now, you'll have to run all the way back to where you were before. I mean, sure, the rooms are still unlocked, but you're likely to take damage along the way. Now, as you explore the game, you will eventually come across Apple and Champ who are frozen in carbonite. Freeing them will unlock them as a playable character, and they're accessible through the pause menu. Of course, this being the master system, you'd think you'd have to get up to hit the button on the console just to switch the characters. But thankfully, if you have a second controller plugged in, you can just use that to access the menu. The cool thing about this is that each character starts with different stats and they have their own health bar, so you can essentially double and then triple your health by unlocking every team member. Even better is that as you explore the base, you'll come across these items which level up your characters. In the beginning, all three characters will have vastly different stats. Apple has the highest jump, which is necessary to reach some areas or get a few items and power-ups. Champ is slow, but has a fully powered-up zillion, which can easily destroy mines and special containers for yet more items. And JJ is the middle-of-the-road character, but as they level up, they will all gain increased health and eventually jump as high as Apple. Additionally, you can also find items that will power up your zillion guns for Apple and JJ, and even scopes that allow you to see alarm sensors. Best of all is, like I said before, these upgrades are all persistent. Once you level up, get a power-up or a scope, it will stay with that character until you turn off your console. And the cool thing is that a lot of these items are optional, so Zillion does a good job at incentivizing player exploration. In fact, Zillion often feels like it's part exploration and part health and inventory management. You always have to keep a lookout for the number of keycards in your inventory and weigh whether or not it's worth sacrificing one to temporarily disable the base's defenses or if you'd rather just take the hit with one of your three characters. And there's no correct answer for this. It really depends on your style of gameplay. I would personally tend to use the key cards as I saw little point in hoarding them and would only switch to taking the hit to my health when I was down to only three cards. And that's really the basis of the game. Go around the base, 
rescue your teammates, earn new powers, collect optional items and power-ups, find the 5 discs and try to survive and manage your health and inventory throughout all of this. It really makes for an engaging experience and honestly one of the best games on the Master System. I'm actually quite sad that I did not learn how to properly play Zillion until recently. If I did, I would have included this game on my top 30 Sega Master System games video. Not sure where I would have ranked it, but most likely around the top 15. Unfortunately though, for as fun as Zillion is, it does have some problems. For starters, the level design can feel downright sloppy. There's a bunch of rooms where you're forced to take damage and there's no way around it. Additionally, the controls are a bit on the stiff side, which can make combat feel pretty sloppy. It's easy to get hit because of how much of a delay there is between you pressing a button and the character jumping or ducking. Or the fact that some foes can knock you out of a room and force you to restart it all over again. And I also felt that there are some jumps that actually become harder after upgrading your jump because of your new jump arc. One odd thing I noticed is that while rescuing Apple is basically required to progress through the game, as her jump is mandatory in the early stages of the game, the same does not really apply to Champ. You can actually have a fully powered up Apple and JJ by the time you rescue Champ, making him superfluous and only useful for the extra health. I mean, he becomes as useful as the rest of them if you level him up a bit, but the point is that he's mostly optional. Whereas, you won't be able to progress with just JJ as his level will not be high enough at that point. The issue with this though is that if Apple or JJ die in the early stages, you might have just locked yourself out of any progression. Because JJ may not be able to clear a necessary jump to progress and Apple may not be able to blow up some of the intermediate canisters. If that happens, you might as well just lose on purpose to get a continue and wait. Is that what Baron Rick looks like in this game? Why is he so scrawny? Dude is supposed to be an absolute unit. Sorry, I got a little distracted there. But yes, at that point, you're better off getting a game over, so you can start exactly where you left off with a fully healed party. With that said though, you only get 3 continues, and considering how difficult Zillion is, the looming threat of a permanent game over is a very real scenario. And no, Amy will not heal dead characters. So if someone from the team dies and no one else has a long jump, you really have no choice but to die on purpose. Also, as you might have already noticed, yes, Opa Opa from Fantasy Zone is in this game. Which makes sense. After all, Zillion is a Sega Tatsunoko collaboration. And Opa Opa is a minor character in the anime series. In fact, this game does a really good job at portraying the anime in game format. Not only do you have the characters, bad guys and can play as each of the Zillion main cast, but you also have the anime soundtrack being rendered in 8-bit, as every song in this game was taken from the anime. I've met a few people who love the Master System Zillion theme, but never realized there was an anime behind it. So if you're one of those, Allow me to introduce you to the full Zillion theme. That's really cool. It's just a shame that you only hear this theme in the intro and while they're outside the Nosa base. Throughout the rest of the game, you hear one of the anime's action themes, which is well reproduced here, but man, it gets really grating after a while. Especially considering how long it can take you to beat the game. Not helped by the fact 
that there are no password or save features. You're expected to beat the game in just one sitting. So, uh, good luck with that. I also wish there were more visual variety. Yes, the game is nice and colorful, and the sprites are pretty large. So it basically makes good use of the Master System hardware. And I also like the area just outside the enemy base. But then you get to the actual base and it all just kind of looks the same. Sure, rooms will change color, but that's really about it. But these few flaws do not stop Zillion from being one of the best Master System games I've ever played. If anything, I'm quite sad that I did not learn how to properly appreciate this game until recently. But now, it's time to check out the sequel. The very next year we got Zillion to the Triformation. And man, considering how good the first game is, surely the sequel ironed out all the issues. Right? Well, no. You see, Zillion 2 isn't even in the same genre as the previous game. They instead turned it into a straightforward shooting game. So, taking place directly after the events of the first game, Zillion 2 The Triformation sees you once again taking control of JJ against the Noza forces. Funny thing, the manual still calls them Norsa, but the game now refers to them as the Noza, except it's also misspelled here, because they forgot the H. Put it in H! Anyway, the genre change is a bit disappointing. I mean, Zillion 1 was a little rough around the edges, but overall it was a great enjoyable game with enough room for improvement. Had they actually continued and improved the formula from the first game, Zillion 2 could have been one of the best 8-bit games ever made. But sadly, it wasn't meant to be. I wouldn't even mind the genre change so much if they actually did a good job at it. But they kinda didn't. You see, in Zillion 2 you have two types of levels. The bike stages, where the level scrolls constantly at a high speed, and the on-foot stages. The bike levels are pretty basic. You can jump, shoot, move forward or backward, and that's pretty much it, really. You can pick up health items or Zillion upgrades. Collect 3 upgrades and your shot now causes more damage and goes through enemies. And this is the only power up in the entire game. Yes, that includes the on foot stages. If you are hoping for a spread gun, flamethrower, laser or homing shots, you can forget about it cause that ain't happening. Well, I suppose there is one other power-up. Occasionally, you'll come across these A icons, which, after being picked up, can be used to transform your bike into a power armor, hence the Triformation title. At first, this looks kinda cool, until you realize that all this does is effectively turn the levels into a very, very, very basic shmup, where you only have two types of weapons a basic pea shooter or a slightly stronger pea shooter. And in case you're wondering, yes, both the bike and the Triformation Fengi are taken from the anime as the characters would use them often. But you know, I kid, but you kind of have to get both the Triformation and the stronger pea shooter. If you miss on picking up any of the power-ups, you're in for a world of hurt, because these levels do not let up. It just keeps throwing so many enemies at you. And you can't just hold the fire button. No, you need to keep tapping it over and over again. And let me tell you, the Master System controller was not made for this. Eventually, I just sorta gave up and decided to bring out the 6-button Genesis controller, which made the entire game a lot easier. And my recommendation is that you do the same. But yeah, that's pretty much it for the bike levels. There are no other power-ups or pickups, and there are no bosses. You just need to survive the gauntlet of enemies it keeps throwing at you. 
which is made more difficult when you take into account how large your sprite is. At least if you die, you start out at nearly the exact same spot where you left off. But you'll also have lost the few power-ups you've collected so far, and there's a good chance you may not be able to recover. Next, we have the on-foot segments, and man, this is such a downgrade from the first zillion. I mean, visually it looks great. Zillion 2 as a whole is a nice graphical upgrade from the first game, with more varied backgrounds and larger sprites. But man, these on-foot segments are so shallow. First of all, there are no upgrades or weapon pickups at all. No. Not even life or health pickups. What you see is what you get. You can jump, duck, shoot, and that's it. Oh, and you also can't play as Apple or Champ. The funny thing is, you still have the option of rescuing them in levels 2 and 4 specifically, but you cannot play them on the on-foot segments. In the bike sections, you can use the second controller to open a menu and then switch the rest of your teammates. But don't get you excited, it's not nearly as interesting as the first zillion. When you do this, your sprite changes to reflect the new character and they have their own health bar. And that's it. No different stats, weapons power-ups or jumping mechanics. What's even worse is that you can only call on your teammates once per game. Not per level, per game. So you might as well just save them for the more difficult stages. The weird part is, if you didn't read the manual, you'd have no way of knowing you can access Apple or Champ. Anyway, the on-foot levels are also entirely linear, so there's no exploration to be had here. And considering how basic your moveset is, the enemies also have really simple patterns, including the bosses. I think I died more often due to the stiff controls than I did because of the game. Like how you can't jump and shoot at the same time. No, instead, you have to stop shooting, then jump, and then you can shoot again. I'm sorry, but what kind of running gun doesn't let you jump while shooting? The stiff controls are actually your worst enemy here, and they are the only reason why I had trouble with some of the bosses. Getting the jump timing right to avoid their shots is the hard part, but once you've mastered it, this game becomes a breeze and can be cleared in just over 20 minutes. Again, a far cry from the first game. Another weird thing is how Opa Opa makes a return in this game, but now it's evil and it's trying to kill you. Which is kind of weird, because in the anime there are two Opa Opas, but they're both good, so this is a bit of a weird lore change. But yeah, Zillion 2 The Triformation is just such a disappointing follow-up to a great game. I wouldn't even mind so much if the game were actually good. But no, even as a shmup or a run and gun, this is a completely shallow experience. At least the graphics are better and the music is pretty good too. It's even FM compatible, meaning you now have three 8-bit renditions of the Zillion theme song for the Master System. But other than that, there's nothing here for Zillion 1 fans, shooting fans or even fans of the anime. <sighs> that is a lot of Zillion. But this is also where the games end, as they only ever made two of these, which is a bit of a shame, as this series had a lot of potential. But, hey, you know what? Seeing as how I've talked about it so much, let's check out the anime as well. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is, I love this intro. I really dig this aesthetic and the theme song is pretty great. Anyway, the story takes place in Planet Maris, which is being invaded by an alien species called the Noza. But then, and I kid you not, God himself comes down to Planet Maris and gives them handguns imbued with the power of justice to defend themselves. I am not making this up. I'm sorry, but I just cannot get over the idea of God beaming down to Earth and being like, hey, here's a handgun. And you might think, oh wow, so God armed the entire planet with guns to defend themselves against the noses? That's pretty cool of him. 
No, not really. God must be working on a limited budget, because he could only afford to give humanity three handguns to defend themselves in an interplanetary war. I am literally three minutes into the first episode and I'm already loving this. So, what's so special about these guns? Basically, their shots will disintegrate anything they touch. The guns are so powerful, in fact, that as the series progresses, the riders seem to gradually tone them down. I mean, in one of the early episodes, a single shot was enough to destroy an entire mountaintop. Anyway, it's here that we're introduced to our main character, JJ. He's cocky, he's a rebel, he does things his own way, and he does not care what you think about him. You know, an asshole. No, seriously, JJ is an asshole. The dude spends the entire series disobeying orders, disobeying protocol, thinking he's better and smarter than everyone, and generally getting the rest of his team in danger. There's an episode where the team has to escort an idol and JJ spends the first half groping her without consent. He's an asshole. Or how about the multiple episodes where JJ endangers his team or the mission because he forgets his equipment or throws a temper tantrum? And we're supposed to root for this guy? Seriously? Oh, and yes, that's Opa Opa from Fantasy Zone. He's basically a minor character and exists just to look cute and be comic relief. The rest of the cast is also introduced. Champ, who's an asshole, though not as much as JJ, and Apple, who's like the only decent person in the group. So it's kinda weird how she later develops feelings for JJ. Like, Apple, sweetie, I know your choices are limited, but you can do better. You can do so much better. This ragtag team of special military operatives are known as the White Nuts. No, seriously, that's their name. I know in the games and the English dub, they were changed to White Knights. But man, White Nuts? Seriously? And I just can't get over how a special military ops team is basically going around shooting aliens with the Master System light guns. I'm actually loving this. I did notice the animation was much better in the first three episodes. And from there on, you have a series of highs and lows. The early episodes also do a good job at portraying the Noza as a serious threat, as they were not afraid to show them just outright murdering civilians and killing entire cities. But as the series went on, the Noza murdering sprees were more implied instead of being shown. The show also falls back into that old formula of the bad guys coming up with a new plan to take over the world every week, like destroying the human's energy grid or poisoning our water supply, only to then be stopped by the white nets. <coughs> white nets. <laughs> I'm sorry, I promised myself I wouldn't laugh and therefore maintaining the status quo. But then, other times, you would have a fair bit of plot progression, with new characters being introduced and the war itself progressing more towards one side or the other. You also have Baron Ricks, the main villain from the games, who is the only genuinely interesting character in the entire show. He's basically the Noza High Commander, but as he starts accumulating a string of defeats, the dude develops an obsession with JJ, to the point where the Noza High Command brand him a traitor. Eventually, he's thought to be dead, only to then return as a recurring character that is out to eliminate the White Nuts, but is also being targeted by the Noza Army. He's quite literally the only character in this series with an actual character arc, which culminates with him befriending JJ before dying. Speaking of the Baron's death, at some point in the anime, you actually learn about the Noza's motivation. As it turns out, the narration you get at the beginning of every episode saying they're just trying to expand their empire is actually not true. Basically, they need a new planet as a breeding ground or their entire species will go extinct. And in fact, by the end of the series, their time is up and the Noses start dying by themselves and will even launch a desperate attack to try and secure a breeding ground to ensure their species survival. What's even weirder is that even after learning all of this, the narrator at the start of every episode will still lie to you and tell you that the Noses are just trying to expand their empire. That lying asshole. 
That's a real scumbag of a narrator if you ask me. Then again, it is kind of weird how they are so clearly named and designed after a certain real world faction, whose name I can't pronounce because of the YouTube algorithm, and yet halfway through, the anime tries to present them in a sympathetic light. Look, Zillion, I get what you're trying to do. Really, I do. But if you're going to make a sympathetic villain, you really shouldn't have named them after that certain group. Also interesting is how the world of Zillion will completely change aesthetics at random. This show takes place in the 24th century, and yet the city looks like any normal anime city from the 80s. Except when it doesn't. Sometimes it looks like the Jetsons, and sometimes it looks like ancient Rome. And sometimes it looks like 1980s New York complete with the Statue of Liberty. There is no consistency, the show will look how the writers and artists wanted to look for that episode. Even the noses seem to occasionally change, and sadly their society is more based around Imperial Japan. Which, you know, considering this is a Japanese anime and that the nose are portrayed as the bad guys, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I guess I just didn't expect subtle political commentary from a 1980s anime made to promote laser tag. And yet, here we are. Actually, speaking of the laser tag, initially the zillion guns in the anime came with a few limitations. Like how you need to wait half a second between each shot, how it has a low battery which often results in the characters running out of ammo, and that it takes 30 seconds for the zillion to be used again when you insert a new battery pack. I can't be quite certain, but I think that these might be limitations of the actual zillion toy, that the writers subtly introduced into the anime's lore. Overall, I quite enjoy this anime. I mean, I wouldn't call it a classic, but as far as Saturday morning anime go, you could do far worse. I still feel its biggest issue is how unlikable the main character is. Still, it's a pretty fun anime and you can find the entire series on YouTube. But we're still not done yet, because one year later we'd get the direct to VHS release of Zillion Burning Night. A 48 minute special with vastly better animation and a surprisingly strong emphasis on music. So Zillion Burning Night is actually a reboot of the series, which is kinda surprising considering it hadn't even been a full year since the TV series ended. Suddenly there's no planet Maris, now you're in this post-apocalyptic setting which may or may not be Earth, which to be fair is a pretty cool concept. Unfortunately though, watching this series and the special back to back is pretty jarring, as there are so many changes and not all for the better. For one thing, the White Nuts is now a local pop band playing at a rundown bar, which doesn't sound too bad until you realize that the only reason they did this was to sell you on more albums by Risa Yuki, who was the singer behind the opening, closing and then the vocal themes from the anime series. And here, they're going to play a bunch of songs from whatever album she was launching at the time and you're just gonna have to sit there and listen to them. I like the opening song for the anime series, but I didn't really care for the ones in this special. I don't know, I just feel that being forced to sit and wait while a song plays in an action anime is a bit of a downgrade. That's a bit of a downgrade there. Just wait, you'll see what I mean. So, who are the bad guys in this anime? Could it be the Nose that are invading a post-apocalyptic Earth? I mean, that'd be pretty cool. Well, actually, no. The new villains in this special are... Hold on, let me just check my notes here. Um, Hillbillies. That's a bit of a downgrade there. And their motivation for all of this is they want to kidnap Apple and force her to marry one of their sons. That's a bit of a downgrade there. Oh, and Apple, who used to be the hand-to-hand -hand combat specialist, is just grabbed without any resistance and spends most of the special locked in a room or waiting to be saved. That's a bit of a down- Okay, you get the idea, right? 
Look, maybe I'm being too harsh, as the special is actually pretty good. I enjoyed the animation, style, the action and even the music when it wasn't being intrusive. But a lot of these changes were simply not for the better. I know I keep focusing on Apple, but JJ and Champ aren't much better either, as their personalities have also been completely flanderized. Yes, they gave each other a hard time, but they also knew how to set aside their differences when the situation calls for it, and having your friend be kidnapped should have been one of those situations, but instead they bicker all the time or just ditch each other. Still, I will say, it's kind of cool how the Noza were incorporated into this special. Basically, Baron Rick, the Noza assassins and the Empress were now redesigned into being human beings, which is a pretty cool concept. Baron Rick is basically the hillbilly's bodyguard, though I don't find him as interesting in this version as I did in the original. Oh, and do you know what else is missing from this special? The zillion guns. You know, the thing that this entire franchise is named after? Yeah, they're not here. I mean, yes, they're given weapons that look like the zillion guns, but they're just regular guns, with bullets. Small, never leave me. Oh, we're still doing this? Okay. That's a bit of a downgrade there. The special ends like you would expect it to. Our heroes save Apple, defeat the hillbillies, roll credits, more J-pop. I'm not even sure you could call this Zillion. I mean, yeah, technically it has the same characters. But it honestly seemed like some random anime movie that Tatsunoko was working on before deciding to add the Zillion characters at the last moment, just so they could sell more toys or albums. I mean, it's not a bad anime. If anything, I find this world has a lot more potential. But it's just not Zillion. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. As far as I know, no other piece of Zillion media was ever made. I've heard conflicting sources as to whether or not Zillion was successful in Japan, but considering all of its shows and games came out within the span of a year or two and then just suddenly stop, I'd say the game, album and toy sales were not what Sega and Tatsunoko were expecting. And in the rest of the world, Zillion is mostly just known for the Master System games. And even then, not that famous outside of that particular circle. Except that is for Brazil. At the time, Sega licensed the Zillion name and branding to a small up-and-coming startup known as Tech Toy, and they did such a good job at promoting it that the anime is now considered a classic by many over there, and the toy was highly sought after by those who could afford it, as this thing was not cheap. In fact, Sega was so impressed by Tech Toy's work that a few years later they would also give them the rights to market the Master System and the Mega Drive in that country, which, as we all know, became an incredible success within the Brazilian market. And if that story isn't a cool example of a domino effect, then I don't know what is. But now we've reached the end of our video, and I can't help but feel like I've forgotten something. But what? I mean, I've reviewed every Zillion property, so what am I forgetting? Oh, the laser tech! I forgot about the laser Hey everyone, thank you for watching Stika's Retro Corner. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell and share this video. All that fun social media stuff. And you can also support me on Patreon. It may not seem like it, but even one dollar is a really big help in keeping the channel going. I'd also like to thank my newest Patreon supporter, Sebastian Velez. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Bye!